that. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jean-Francois Cloutier. I come from uh, Portland, Maine. Uh, I organize the uh, Portland, Maine Erlang Elixir uh, Meetup. I also uh, code an elixir for a living. I'm, I'm a, one of the lucky few, and I hope you so much luck yourselves. It's really uh, a good way of earning a living. It's very fun. Um, but I'm going to talk to you not about my job. I'm going to talk to you about my hobby. And my hobby uh, in these days is to uh, do robotics using Elixir. And if you want to follow along uh, with the slides, uh, there's a PDF of the slides at this URL. Uh, this URL will appear on uh, top of the uh, next few slides, so you'll catch up. Uh, so first of all, let me, let me uh, introduce to you uh, Mark. Mark is this. Lego Mindstorm uh, EV3 robot, which I've been programming. And it's got some uh, nice features. It's got an ultrasonic sensor to uh, sense the proximity of obstacles. It's got a, a little motor, medium motor, that kind of symbolizes its mouth, so it will activate when it's eating. Um, I have a speaker um, so that it can emote and say things say how it feels. Uh, it has a color sensor, which I, I use for the robot to detect food. And um, food is a, a particular color that it sees on the floor. Um, there's a beacon. A beacon simulates the scent of food. So the robot can smell. And it smells, uh, it will smell with the infrared uh, detector. But it also has two large motors, uh, left wheel, uh, right wheel, to move about. A touch sensor, it's connected to a bumper, which you see in the front to uh, detect uh, frontal collisions. And this infrared sensor, which it uses to both sense the distance to the, the food and the uh, uh, relative direction of the food. And finally, there are uh, LEDs on top of the robot. And I use that to also to communicate uh, emotional state of the robot. This is an autonomous robot. And most importantly, this robot is uh, powered by Elixir. Now, Basically, this is the kind of the behavior of the robot. It, Marv, Marv is curious, so uh, it roams around, trying to avoid collisions and trying to get unstuck when it gets stuck. Uh, but when it gets hungry, and it does get hungry, then it starts foraging for food, looking for food. Unless, of course, Marv is scared, in which case he panics and acts like a headless chicken. So that's that's Marv. Uh, the blue paper you see at the top, that's the food. It's looking for the food. And, on, and just above the food there, you see a little beacon. That's the scent of the food. And Marv will say a number of things. It'll say, I'm hungry. Uh ho, when it's colliding. Uh, I'm stuck when it's getting stuck. I'm scared when it's getting scared. And uh, when it's uh, eating, it'll say, nom, da nom, da nom, da nom. OK. So let's, let's uh, watch. Let's watch uh, Marvin in action. So now it's, um, it's roaming around. It's uh, getting stuck. It knows it's stuck because it's trying to move, and it doesn't detect a change in position. So it just said, aho, aho. Now it's getting unstuck, moving about, moving about. And it tries to avoid collisions. So you'll, you'll see that it, oh, whoops tries to avoid collisions. Sometimes it's successful. Now it's hungry, and it's just picked up the scent of food. It's moving quite fast. As it gets closer, it gets, slows down and, and orients itself more precisely. Ah, found the food. So it says, oh, nom, da nom, da nom. And, and it's eating the food. The little motor is activating. And it's going to eat until it's full. And when it's full, it's going to say, OK, I'm not hungry anymore, so let's go back to um, roaming around. I'm a curious robot. Let's see what's out there. 
Okay, but now it tried to move and it got stuck. So it, it was, I'm scared. So now it's acting really, really panicky and doing very silly things. The, the, the red lights are flashing. It's running around like a headless chicken until it calms down and continues roaming. Now it finds that it's, uh-oh, it collides, uh-oh. So it uh, tries to avoid the collision. And it keeps moving around. Uh, there's some random elements. It's trying to avoid, but it can't avoid that obstacle. So now it's, again, stuck. It realizes it's stuck. It says, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. And we'll try to get unstuck. There we go. Moves around. Whoop! Oh, food. I'm hungry. It's been a while. All that exertion. Finds the food by the color. Nom da nom da nom da nom. Nom da nom. Eats. Is really happy. That's a fulfilled robot there. Belly full. Decides, okay, let's do some more roaming. And on and on. So that's the totally autonomous robot. And it's powered by uh, Elixir. Now, how did I get there? How did I get started in, in, in having so much fun? It started about uh, a few months ago in June. I, wa I saw this talk by uh, uh, Torben Hoffman at uh, Alexa User Conference 2015 uh, using Alexa to get the fun back into Lego Mindstorm. He basically he installed uh, Alexa and started doing fun things with it. And this is made possible by a, a group of people called uh, EV3 Dev. And EV3 Dev is a variant of Debian Linux that you can boot the EV3 with, because the EV3 has a, a, a port for a micro SD card, and you can boot from that card. So you can boot your own operating system on that little machine. It's really cool. And EV3 Dev, what it does is it exposes the motors and the sensors of the robot uh, to you, the programmer. And the way it does that is very simple. It exposes the connected motors and sensors as directories containing ASCII files. So for example, for a sensor, you would uh, read the driver name file, just ASCII, it would give you the name of the sensor. What kind of sensor? Is it a color sensor? Is it a touch sensor? Uh, mode would tell you what mode it's in, because some sensors have multiple modes. Uh, the light sensor can t uh, see color, reflected light, ambient light. So you, have, you can set the mode. You write the name of the mode into the mode file, and that's it. You've, you've changed the mode of the sensor. And you can read the measurement from the sensor by just getting the value uh, from the file called value 0 or value 1, depending on, on what you're getting, uh, going for. Motors, the same thing. Driver name will tell you if it's a medium motor or a large motor. You can um, uh, tell the motor what to do by writing the command into the command file. Run forever, run to position, run relative. And you can also set the parameters ahead of that, say, what's the uh, speed that I want you to, to, to have, speed SP. And then you can read from that file, what's your current speed? So you have all these very simple ways of, of interacting with the robot. And you can do that from any programming language that runs on Linux, which means Alexa. Wow! That's exactly how I felt. So obviously, obviously, called uh, contacted my friends from Amazon, and a kit was on its way. As uh, soon as it arrived, my technical staff uh, ran some acceptance testing <laughs> while I was busy getting EV3 Dev on an uh, SD card, which is very straightforward. Follow the instructions, ev3dev.org. Really great work these guys did. So that went very quickly. Plug the SD card. Reboot the, the, the uh, AV3, and uh, AV3 dev comes up. And a little shout out here to David Lechner, who's the main contributor, and he's very, very helpful. He's there at all ungodly hours of day and night answering issues. Great guy. All right, but at this point, I'm still tethered to uh, my EV3. I have a USB cable, so I'm, I'm, I have a USB network. And uh, I don't want that, of course. You don't want your robot to be tied in, right? So the first thing I try is Bluetooth. But I have a Bluetooth machine, and I just, for the, the love of God, I cannot get the connection going. It won't speak to me. And eventually, I trace the problem to uh, Ubuntu, and there's lots of issues, and you look for answers, and there's no real good answer. So 
I gave up, dejected. And then I went for Wi-Fi. I got myself a uh, little dongle, and plugged it in. Boom, it worked. Wonderful. So now I have my, uh, my uh, EV3 brick, which is the, the brain uh, of, of the robot. And I can plug in the motors and, and the sensors and, and start just playing with it, just straight from the terminal. So I, I, I connect over Wi-Fi. I go into uh, slash sys slash class. I can see um, um, Lego sensor, the, 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 there's Lego sensor, and then there's a Lego uh, a tech, tech motor. These are the two directories that are really of, of interest to me. Lego sensor, I go, I see, oh, it detects four connected sensors. I go to sensor zero. I can see all those files that will, t will tell me about sensor zero and uh, allow me to control it. Very nice. And um, let's say uh, I go into uh, uh, sensor two here. I say, uh, I read what's in the driver name, it's the color sensor. I say, what are the modes that are supported? Reflect, ambient color, the other ones are not really useful to me. I say, okay, what's the current uh, mode color? Okay, well, what's the color that you're seeing? And I, I, I put a, a blue sheet of paper underneath, it says, oh, it's seven, it's blue. I put another color, it says, oh, it's two. I don't remember what color it is, it's a green. And then I say, okay, I'm gonna change you to ambient light. And I'm gonna say, okay, what's ambient light? Well, it's 10%. Good, so I, it's working, very nice. And same thing for the motors. Go to the tackle motor, get, get, get a motor zero, it's the medium motor, I can see what the commands, I can run, run forever. I can say, okay, what's the duty cycle specification? That's zero, I'm gonna put it at 100, which means work as hard as you can, 100%. I say run forever, what's your speed? Pretty high speed, number of uh, um, degrees per second of rotation, that's basically what the speed is and I can then write the stop command and I stop the motor. Everything's working, wonderful. I want Elixir to do that for me. So I need to install uh, Erlang and Elixir on, on uh, uh, my little uh, Linux that's residing on that micro SD card. It's easy, it's easy, uh, relatively easy. For Erlang, uh, you, need to, you need to go and do a complete build from sources because that's the only way you can get release 18. And that works, just follow the instructions, it works. There's a little gotcha, you gotta uh, turn off the, um, the um, uh, in-memory swap, memory swap, uh, um, virtual memory swapping, uh, and put it back on the SD card so you have enough room to do the build. So there's a little gotcha, so I, it's on my blog. If you have questions, you, you can contact me. It's a very simple workaround, and it will build. It'll take a while, it will build overnight, but it will build. Elixir, of course, download the, the, the pre-compiled zip, install it, done. So where am I? I? I reboot, I can run, here we go, I've got Elixir running on the EV3. And that makes me very, very happy. Okay, now what? What do I do with this? Well, I have a bunch of questions I'd like to answer for myself. And that's kind of my, my program of investigation here. Well, one, can I interact with my robot using pure, pure functions? I'm using Elixir, functional programming. What will it look like, a, fun a pure functional approach to interacting with my robot, with my motors and sensors? Can I do that? What will it look like? Question two, I don't want my robot to be driven by a giant control loop sequentially. Hey, it's Elixir. We've got processes, right? So can my robot be driven, we've got agents, can my robot be driven by a society of agents? And, and we'll talk a little bit more what that means, but if you've seen the movie Inside Out, the Pixar movie Inside Out, you know intuitively what it means to, as an individual, to be a society of agents. Three, how good a fit is Elixir for robotics as a whole? Is that a great tool or is that a super great, cool, great tool? So I wanted to answer that question. Can I interact with my robot using pure functions? Question one, let's see now. So you all know, of course, what a function is. Input, output, no side effects. So it, what do I have? It, what does EV3, EV3 dev give, give me? It gives me basically uh, global and mutable states with side effects. That's what it gives me. What, what is a file? It's a, it's a global variable and I write to it and I read from it. So uh, that's not exactly the model I want. So I want to create this, this barrier there, and on this side, have uh, functions and immutable data. 
and I want first a function that gets me all the connected devices, and each device becomes an immutable piece of data. As you'll see, it's a struct. Then I want to be able to have a function that takes this device, device being either a motor or a sensor, and then change the parameters, change the speed, change the mode, and then I get a new device. Then I want to be able to say, OK, um, if it's a sensor, all right, go, sense. Tell me how dark it is. Tell me how far we are. If it's a motor, go, run, activate. And I may even get a, uh, get a new device out of it, because this might change the state of the device. And then you rinse and repeat. And that way you get you know, a, a functional model of interacting with sensors and motors. So it's pretty simple. And I think one of the key lessons of functional programming is that you have simple data and small stepwise transformations. And that makes people not so bright like myself be able to actually do something interesting. So a, a struct here is used to represent a device. The device is either a motor or a sensor. So I have, what do I have? I have these, these, these attributes of class. Is it a sensor, a motor, or an LED? Uh, path, where is it in the uh, file structure that I can find uh, my sensor, my motor? Port, is, where is it connected to? Uh, port A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. What type of motor sensor or LED is it? Is that a color sensor? Is it a large motor? Uh, props would contain the, the idiosyncratic properties of this particular sensor or this particular motor. And mock is either true or false, because I, I, in order to do testing, I, I, I have also sensors and motors mock sensors and mock, mock motors in, uh, on, my, uh, on my laptop. OK, so that's very straightforward. And, in, and reading and writing to the, the file system is very straightforward as well. So we have you know, uh, reading uh, the, the attribute, what's the, what's the current color of, what's the current value 0 for that sensor. Uh, writing, uh, I want to change the mode of uh, that uh, sensor or change the, uh, the speed specification of that motor. Then I want to, reading is just very simple code as well, with some transformations, just to make it very clean, and writing as well. So we won't go too in deep, deeply into each, into the code itself. It's available to you. But I just want to impress upon you that uh, that's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy. And uh, we're talking about you know, the discovery. Getting, I want to get all the sensors, for example, that are connected to uh, uh, the brick. So uh, I, if, I, if I'm not in testing mode, then I essentially uh, scan the, the right directory, which is the uh, uh, Lego sensor directory. And I get all the files uh, out of it, the file names. And then I filter and just get the, 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 the file names that represent actual sensors, actual motors. And then from uh, that file, that for each file that represents a sensor, um, I just, in it, create this, this struct representing the sensor. And that's really straightforward as well. I, uh, I, OK, I, I get the port name. I get the driver name. I extract the type of sensor from the driver name I, um, using a regex. Then I construct my, uh, my sensor device, set the mode, and here, I'm done. Straightforward. Uh, when you want to interact, you want to set the mode. I want to say on my uh, color sensor, I want it to uh, read ambient light. Well, it's just a matter of if, if it's not already the mode it's in, then set the attribute and then get the new device out with the new mode so that you're, you're not going to be using this device for further calls, as we saw in the diagram. How do I... Uh, uh, now, uh, access my various sensors, color sensor, light sensor, and whatnot. Um, all the sensors implement a behavior, so I, they expect to be able to uh, respond to, uh, to, to uh, implement the function senses. What are all the things you can sense? Color, ambient, and reflected in this case. And here, read sensor, read uh, color, or read ambient, or read reflected, and that's, that's just a dispatch. And then a reading is very straightforward. You just get the attribute, just read from the file system, and then translate the, the result that you get into, uh, into an actual uh, meaningful value. And return the value in the updated sensor. Because in order to read the color, you may have had to set the sensor to color mode. And so what I return is a value in the updated sensor. And that updated sensor is going to be the one that I'm going to interact with from going forward. All right. So 
going very fast, but that's essentially the strategy I employed to uh, uh, do functional programming uh, on my uh, robot. And yes, indeed, I can, of course, I can interact with my robot using pure functions as if there was any doubt. But it's very nice. So I've created a, a small domain-specific uh, domain language, and this becomes the basis for what comes next. Now, that's the big question. That's really the one that got me uh, interested, because um, long, long time ago, uh, I, 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 I was in, in the world of AI, and um, I was very interested in the, the concepts of society of mind and society of agents and whatnot. And I thought, hey, can I do that on my robot? Can I implement a society of agents? Is it possible? As opposed to this, I didn't want that big control loop. That's not how our mind works. We're not just one big control loop. We have all these things going on in our mind at the same time, sometimes conflicting, sometimes working together, exchanging information. And out of that emergent cacophony, out of that cacophony emerges who we are. So on a very, very simpler uh, scale, can I do that with my robot? Okay, the idea comes from Marvin Minsky. You may uh, have heard of him. He, was, uh, he passed away just a, a, a few weeks ago. He was probably one of the most influential uh, AI and cognitive science uh, uh, individuals. Very, very smart man. He, he wrote The Society of Mind in the mid-80s. That's the one that influenced me. And this came out in 2005, The Emotion Machine, which I'm reading right now. And what, I, what, what I'm doing is a very, very, very pale and simplistic reflection of what he's, he's come up with. And what he's come up with is that the fact that there's this theory that uh, the mind is a society, a society of agents, small, simple processes, these agents. And of course, we know agents, processes, we go, Elixir, of course we do. And it's all of them working together uh, exchanging information, processing information in different ways that we get intelligence, from that that we get intelligence, or at least interesting behaviors. All right, so I came up with my homebrew society of mine, society of agent, and this is what it looks like. I have, in terms of the data, because we, we, we look at the data first when we, I think we do functional uh, thinking, you look at the data first, it's what are we gonna be transforming? We're going to have percepts, and percepts are units of perception. How far I am? What's the color? Am I in danger? Am I hungry? Perceptions. Motives are um, units of motivation, uh, you, you, behavior or triggers. Um, um, am, I, am I afraid? Am I curious? Am I, is, is, do I feel hunger? And motives are either turned on or off. Then we have intents. It's, it's units of actions. I want to move forward. I want to move, move backward. I want to turn right. I want to turn left. These are intents. So that's the data that's going to be flowing around. And I have a bunch of agents. And I have detectors, internal clock. I've got perceptors, which is kind of a higher level cognition. I have motivators which decide whether I'm, hungry, uh, I'm, I'm motivated by hunger, I'm motivated by curiosity or not. I have behaviors, what do I want to do, how I'm going to do, go about it, my strategies, how I'm going to act up. Actuators, how, I'm going to, how am I going to move forward, how am I going to move backwards once I've intended to do so. And a nervous system to connect everything together, plus a memory to remember what happened recently. So I'm going to go through each one uh, a little bit more, more details. But first of all, let's look at what a, a, a percept looks like. Again, it's a very simple struct. It says, what is this, this percept about? Is it about distance? Is it about fear? What is it? Uh, the value, if it's distance, is it five? Is it 10? Is it, is it nine? If it's color, is it blue? Is it red? Since, when was that perception uh, realized, um, created, instantiated? How long is it still true? Until what time? Source. Who produced it? Is that a perceptor? Is that a detector? Uh, time to live. How long are we going to remember this thing? Resolution. How precise was the, 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 the value? I mean, if it's distance, a, a distance of three and a distance of four are essentially the same. But a distance of three and a distance of six are not the same. So what's the resolution? Yeah. Transient. Do we want to even remember this, this perception? For example, perception that time has elapsed 
Well, you don't want to remember that, but you want to remember that you were in danger five uh, seconds ago. Very simple. Motives, units of motivation. Again, what is the motivation about? Hunger, fear, value. Is it on or off? When? And importantly, what other motives will this inhibit? I'm sure that being afraid will really do a number on my appetite. When I'm afraid, I'm not hungry. It inhibits my hunger, right? So there are inhibitions across motivations. And source, which motivator turned, turned that motive on and off? Intent, again, simple struct. What is the intent about? Moving forward, moving backward, turning. Value, oh, are you going to move forward fast, slow? Are you going to turn left, right, by how much? When was that intent generated? By whom? And is this a strong intent? If it's a strong intent, the robot is going to work a little bit harder to make it, make it true, make it happen. All right. So let's look at uh, our different agents here in our society of agents a little bit more uh, closely, but not, not in too much details. We have an internal clock. It ticks every second and says, time has passed, time has passed, time has passed. Apparently, uh, that's actually quite a crucial part of a robot. If you don't have a notion of time passing, you can't do anything much. Detectors for each sensor, and actually for each motor, you have a dedicated detector which pulls that device and reads the current value, the, the current color, the current distance, the current speed, and produces a percept, which is then sent to the central nervous system, which will then dispatch it to whoever is interested, including the memory, which will memorize it. All right. Perceptors. Perceptors is higher level perception. It's how do we make of what we've perceived so far in the context of what we're, you know, recent past, what's happening right now in the context of recent past, what do we make of it? For example, I uh, get a distance percept that says 10. I look at a perceptor, which is concerned with collision, will say, in the recent past, was I less than 10 or greater than 10? It says, oh, you were greater than 10. So that means that I'm getting closer to an obstacle. Collision imminent. Perceptor will be interested also in the uh, touch sensor being pressed. If the touch sensor in, is being pressed while in the recent past there was a collision imminent, that means we're colliding now. So perceptors produce higher level percepts, and other perceptors will even produce even higher level percepts. And in that way, you, you create uh, a certain level of awareness of the environment. And of course, uh, these percepts are communicated to the central nervous system, which dispatches them. Good. Each perceptor is, uh, has its own concern, light, collision, and whatnot. And uh, there's a, a, a module, perception, which contains a list of all these configurations. For each configuration, there will be a perceptor. That will be instantiated. And here, the collision one focuses on distance, touch, collision, and time elapse. Nothing else. Doesn't care about motives. Doesn't care, care about past intents. And it will remember for 10 seconds. And it will apply the logic here in the function collision to decide if, indeed, we are uh, looking at producing a collision percept or not. And we'll go into the, the coding of that collision function a little bit later. Motivator. Motivator given percepts that are flowing in, does that mean that I care? Does that mean that I should feel something about this? Does that mean that I should be afraid? Should I, be, should I feel hunger? Or should I stop feeling hunger? Should I stop being afraid? And again, yeah, we have a, a um, motivation uh, uh, module that contains all the definitions for the various uh, motivators. And I have three of them, curiosity, hunger, and fear. And each one uh, focuses, for example, for fear, focuses on uh, a danger, basically. Is, is, is there a danger that's been uh, uh, recognized, uh, perceived? And it applies a logic here, fear, to decide whether to turn it on or off, the, the motive, uh, the fear motive. Let's look at hunger. That's the logic here within the, uh, within the, uh, the, the, the motivation uh, module. When do we turn uh, hunger on or off? And in this case here, this is a simple rule. And here what we have is a function that returns a function with multiple heads. It's nice that the elixir is so, uh, so expressive. But basically what it says here, I will have, um, when I receive a percept that says, oh, um, one perceptor said you're very hungry. 
fine. In the context of uh, uh, prior percepts, all I'm going to say here, if, if I was not in any danger in the last five minutes, yes, fine, turn hunger on. But if my stomach is telling me, you should be hungry, but I'm still remembering that I was in dire danger a few seconds ago, hunger is not going to turn on. I'm still, you know, not ready to, be, to, to feel the hunger. And also here, the fact, uh, we have the fact that this, this uh, motive of hunger will inhibit curiosity. Once you're hungry, you don't roam around. You look for food. And uh, here it says, if uh, the, the, so your stomach, your perceptor tells you you're not hungry, well, you just turn the hunger off. There's no, not, nothing very complicated here. Okay. Behavior. Behaviors are uh, finite state machines that are triggered by motives. If, if hunger is turned on, then we have the foraging behavior that's kicking in. And the forager behavior will be driven by percepts coming in because, uh, uh, as we'll see, well, when it's turned on by hunger, but whether or not we are on track or off track towards getting close to going to the food will direct our behavior, right? What do we do? If I'm, getting, if I'm on track, don't change the direction. Just keep going. If you're off track, is it to the left? Is it to the right? If it's to the left, then turn to the left and try to get back on track. So you have all these state transitions. And for each transition, uh, these transitions are, are driven by new percepts coming in. And uh, with each transition, you have some intents that are generated. OK, oh, you're off track. And the food seems to be coming from that way. Turn that way. And then move forward. Are you still off track? Reorient. Are you on track? Just keep going. All right. And we have also reflexes, which are uh, behaviors that are simply driven by, by perceptions. Um, like, OK, um, at any point in time, whatever you're doing, if you're stuck, if, you, if you're, you perceive that you're stuck, just fire the unstuck behavior and then go back to foraging. Same thing for collision. Just avoid the collision, then go back to foraging. OK. And the, um, this, this uh, behavior, this, fi transition, this uh, finite state machine, is coded as basically uh, structs. And I won't go into more details, but it's pretty straightforward. That didn't take, that took a few hours just to get it done. So again, legs are very expressive, very easy for me to get to where I want. Finally, actuators. How do we go forward? How do we go backward? Well, if I'm, if I'm a two-wheel robot, going forward means moving both wheels the same speed together. If, I'm, if I want to turn, it's moving a wheel in one direction, a wheel in the other direction. If I'm a single-wheel robot, going forward is a very different thing. If I have threads, it's a, very, it's a somewhat it's a different thing as well. So actuators translate intents, like moving forward, moving backward, turning, into a, a scripts of commands that are just commands to the uh, a, a motors themselves. And they look like this. Now going backward is a function. It returns a function. And given the intent, which would contain go forward fast, for example, and, and all the motors that the robot knows of, it would say, OK, uh, let me get the speed out of the intent and, and the duration of the intent. And I'm going to create a little script here called going backward. And I'm going to, in that script, uh, three steps. I'm going to first tell the right wheel how fast it's going to go the left wheel, how fast it's going to go. And then the third step is go, activate, run. And when this script is going to be run, the intent is going to be realized. OK. Finally, there's memory, because uh, a lot of uh, perceptors and motivators depend on context in order to decide whether to be afraid, to be hungry, and whatnot. So there's memory, which essentially just stores all the percepts and all the motives and all the intents that are generated, and then forgets about them over time. So it's short-term memory. And it can be queried. So it's my little data store, right? And the central nervous system is just one big dispatcher. It's an event dispatcher. And it connects all these agents together. Agents don't know of each other. They only know of the central nervous system and memory. That's all they know. And when a percept is created, it's just sent to the central nervous system. And the agents who need to know about that, that percept will be uh, notified of him. 
through handlers, and we'll see that. So that's my uh, little, you know, model of, of, of the mind, my little model of agents. It's driving the robot right now. And just uh, uh, as a recap, so imagine uh, the a detector or an internal clock just generates a percept. It's made available to the dispatch of the perceptor by the uh, central nervous system. The perceptor says, aha, that, given the, the, the recent past, I recognize that we're on an imminent collision course, for example. This is sent, uh, this may be sent to a motivator. And the motivator says, ah, I know how to feel about this. I'm going to turn on a motive. Behavior says, ooh, that triggers me. That triggers me as a behavior. Behavior is triggered, and now, as new percepts are generated, it leads to intents being produced that are listened to by the actuators. It says, ah, so you want to move forward. Fine by me, moving forward. As it moves forward, of course, now the distance between the robot and whatever the obstacle has changed which leads to a new percept being generated, and on and on. So what we have here is all these, these control loops. We don't have one control loop. We have any number of control loops happening at the same time. So we have this society of agents. These agents are, are, are interacting together and all at once, basically. Very different from ye olde giant control loop, sequential control loop. Okay. So that, that's what I wanted to do and did. And this is just a, a, um, a this is Marv's uh, mind map. So you can see all the perceptions that it's capable of, either from detectors or perceptors, uh, the motives that it, 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 it operates, uh, that drives him, fear, curiosity, and hunger, and all the behaviors it has, getting unstuck, which is a reflex, Colliding, well, actually, uncolliding or avoiding colli collision, which is a reflex. Panicking, exploring, and foraging. And all the various, it's vocabulary for actuation. It knows how to turn right, turn left, go forward, go backward, and it knows how to eat. Also knows how to say things. It's not in the picture here. So that's, that's the robot's mind. That's Mars' mind. Now, implementing this, you saw pieces of the implementation, but now I want to I concentrate on the OTP architecture of this. And we, we've covered all of this, this in various talks. We've talked about gen servers. We've talked about supervisors. This, to me, I, I love OTP, but this, to me, this, this problem, this very problem of a society of agents was an absolute marvelous fit for OTP. OTP was just this perfect tool that fits in your hand, and it just becomes part of you. Just amazing feeling. So the, the general architecture of, uh, of this here. So we have EV3, we have a robot supervisor, uh, EV3 application and root supervisor, a uh, robot supervisor that supervises you know, su other supervisors for detectors, perceptors, motivators, behaviors, and actuators. The robot supervisor also uh, supervises uh, three uh, workers, the, C the CNS, memory, and oh. internal clock. And um, the detector supervisor uh, is responsible for uh, instantiating the detectors and restarting them if they fail. Perceptor, same thing, motivator, and actuators. And under the CNS, we have a bunch of uh, uh, handlers, event handlers, gen events, for detectors, perceptors, motivators, and, and whatnot. So that's the general architecture. The source code you can find uh, in here if you want, if you look at it. But we'll just look at a very thin slice. I'm slightly, I might be running a little bit over. So, okay. So if you look at, I just want to give you now a sense of the simplicity of the code. We're not going to go through the code. You can go through the code if you want. This is uh, the EV3, that's the application where you set the, the, um, the, 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 the supervisors on the, re, uh, the, the endpoint, the supervisors. And uh, you, uh, I, when you start it, I can start execution, I can start perception. That's where I start everything. And uh, the robot supervisor, same thing. You can see, you know, just start all the children, and, uh, which are either the workers here or the, the other sub-supervisors. Uh, strategy one for one, very straightforward. And this is where we uh, go into more details into what start perception, start execution is all about. You start the actuators, you start the behaviors, start the motivators. Pretty straightforward. 
Um, starting the perceptors, what does that mean? As well, for each configuration of a perceptor that we f in the module perception, we looked at that earlier. Well, well, you're going to say, okay, super a perceptor supervisor, start me a perceptor based on that configuration. Same thing for the other guys. And let's look at perceptor supervisor. Starting a perceptor, well, you start a child, um, passing the perceptor configuration as, as the state of uh, that child. <coughs> Uh, it is, it is, um, so the supervisor started the child, and that's it, basically. And it's a simple one for one, which means you create it only, you create that, that perceptor only when asked. When asked by the, uh, being asked to start perceptor. Okay? Remember perception, which was where we defined all the configurations for perceptors? And, there they are. Uh, we, we looked at one already. It's pretty straightforward if you decode it a little bit. And the perceptor agent is essentially uh, when it's it's an agent. So it's uh, yes. And when you start it, it's it's started on a per, uh, perceptor configuration, and it's an agent. And you say well, essentially, okay, when you get a percept that's of interest to you. Analyze it, out of it comes a new percept or nil, and that's what you return. The analysis is you run that, that logic, like collision logic, for example. You just run it with the percept in the context of the recent past. That's, a, that's your, of interest to you. And the, the CNS, it's, in this case, it's a gen server. And I did that because I wanted to monitor my gen events. So if they failed, I could actually fail the, the CNS, restart it, and through the supervisor. Otherwise, the failure is silent. The failure of gen events is silent unless you monitor them. And you want to monitor them from a gen server in order to catch the message. So it's just a, a okay, you get, you, when you receive a, a, a percept, just dispatch it. And you dispatch it, you know to the, to the uh, perceptor uh, event handler, straightforward. And since I've, uh, I've registered all my handlers as monitored, if one of them fails, I'm gonna get this message and I'm just gonna crash myself and let my supervisor restart me. It's very, very nice when you're debugging because you don't want silent failures. It's really, really not nice. And finally, bringing everything together, the perceptor handler, well, the CNS has received the percept. It's dispatched it to all the handlers that are uh, uh, registered. One of them is the perceptor handler. It processes the percept. And what it does, it asks all the perceptors that it knows of, that all have the name, all the perceptors it knows of, is this, is this something of, of interest to you? Are you focusing on it? And then analyze that percept You'll give me a nil or a new percept, in which case I will then shoot it back to the CNS so that it re-enters the mind, if you want, and it keeps going. So that's, that's where the loop gets closed. Okay, so can my robot be driven by a society of agents? Yes. Now, my feelings about how uh, Erlang, Elixir, and OTP worked for me well, I found it was remarkably easy to implement that society of agents. Even though it's a relatively complex problem, it just was a perfect fit. The Beam, because of its soft real-time guarantees, I didn't have to think about it. I had all these processes running around. None of them was a hog. None of them precluded other processes. I didn't have a process that would just like take all the time and starve everybody else. None of that. So it was just simple. It just worked, thanks to the Beam. Functional programming, my code was manageable. It was easy for me to express myself. What I meant is what I wrote, and what I wrote was what, what, was what I meant. And that's an excellent feeling. So how good a fit is Elixir OTP for robotics? Totally awesome, totally awesome. I knew that coming in, but I still was shocked how great it was. But wait, there's a little bit more. What else did I learn? I learned about the urgency of now. A robot is not like a program. Time is not elastic. Time is now. Time is a harsh mistress. You can't just react to an intent that's three seconds old. You cannot deal with a percept that's two seconds old because that's the past. 
You're completely out of sync. Your robot is out of sync with the past. So you have to deal with that because it happens. This is a slow processor. There's a lot of things going on. So what I did, my solution was ignore stale percepts, ignore stale motives and intents. And if they have stale intents, send a, 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 an alarm message to the central nervous system saying, I'm overwhelmed. And the central nervous system will tell the perceptors and detectors, shut down. Shut down. Don't see anything. Become blind. Faint. I make the robot faint. And everything else can kind of wash through the system. And then after a little while, a second, half a second, the CNS <laughs> revives. And now everything is in sync. We're now dealing with the present, not the past. So that worked. Another thing I learned, debugging a robot is painful. If it's the real world. The effect of commands are predictable. You want to say, you say, move forward. Well, if the wheel is slipping, you haven't moved forward. So you don't know for sure that what you ask for is going to happen. Sensors can lie. They see ghosts sometimes. Overall behavior is very sensitive to tuning. And the Heisenberg principle applies. If you start tracing things, you change timing of things, and then the problem you've seen is gone. So that's interesting. And debugging is really much harder because of all these things, and also because the deploy edit cycle is long. It's a slow computer. All right. I also learned Elm to build a dashboard. It, it's really cool, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. It's a highly reactive dashboard. Things happen all the time. If I had three more minutes, I'd activate one. But I used Phoenix, I used Elm, and really, it's, it's the best thing, the best combo. It's better than peanut butter and jam. But that's another story. And I'm, I'm really, really eager to answer your questions and, and, and show you the dashboard if you're interested uh, when the talks are over. So parting thoughts. A robot is a bunch of sensors and actuators working together to act, achieve shifting goals in a dynamic environment. So it's more than just a robot that we've been looking at here. Because this is true also of a smart house, of anything else that will come out from the Internet of Things. It's the same kind of problem. Now, societies of agents have evolved everywhere in nature. Everywhere you look, you'll see societies of agents. There's a reason why. Maybe the Internet of Things needs to form societies of agents as it evolves, as it tackles more complex problems. And Elixir will be a fantastic enabler. I have a blog. You can see more of the details. And I'm really happy to answer your questions later, after uh, all the talks are done. And I want to thank you all. This is where you can find me. I organize the Portland, Maine, Erlang, Erlang Elixir Meetup. And again, you can find the slides at this URL. Thank you very much.